please join me in welcoming Noah and Kala. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> so we can just introduce ourselves. Yeah. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll start. So I, I, I told Noah that I was just going to feed him questions and have all what? the focus be on Noah. No, I don't <laughs> know. I'm, I'm actually here to interview Noah for no. on behalf of everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I'll introduce myself and then talk a little bit about about my Kuleana and and what we do uh, on the mountain. So, <laughs> mahalo for that awesome. Um, introduction. That was, that was a beautiful model for practicing seeing my name. I appreciate that. Um, my name Kala. Uh, I shortened it to Kala. That gets mispronounced often. And I appreciate you taking the time to say it correctly. Mahalo um, me. So as, as, as she said, I'm the coordinator for the Mauna Kea Forest Restoration Project. And, and uh, we obviously, as the name suggests, we work primarily on Mauna Kea. Uh, we are responsible for managing and maintaining um, the high elevation subalpine dry forest of Monica, that's the Mamane rainforest, Mamane dry forest, sorry. Um, uh, specifically to supplement uh, food sources for Palila, the critically endangered Palila. And then I, I brought an example of the Palila here. This is, these are two taxidermied Palila. These are the Palila themselves. And it, um, by a show of hands, anybody, has anyone, does anyone know what a Palila is? Right. Okay. Who, who has seen a polila in the wild? That's awesome. That's very awesome. Yeah. So we're going to, I think the intent is to share about um, kind of how polila is doing right now. I'm sure if you folks are at all connected with Malamain or conservation work right now um, with what's going on, you may or may not be abreast at kind of how the, the population of polila is doing. Uh, forest birds in general across the state are not doing not doing so well and the same goes for Palila here on Hawaii Island. Um, um, so as I mentioned earlier, so we're responsible for managing the subalpine rainforest and, and what, what I mean by that, what, how we accomplish that is um, you, utilizing volunteers, hardworking volunteers from our community, which I, I see a handful of you here now um, to restore uh, Mamane. So we go out and we outplant, utilizing volunteers to plant uh, thousands and thousands of mamane and koa specifically on the mountain. So we um, we plant about 30 or 20 to 40,000 trees a year and we try to maintain those levels uh, in a couple specific areas on Mauna Kea. So um, the Palila, I'm uh, sorry, the Mauna Kea Forest Restoration Project uh, officially started back in 2009 and prior to that um, we were known as the Palila Project. And the Palila Project was made up of USGS uh, as well as uh, Division of Forestry and Wildlife. And their main responsibility um, and Kuleana was to go out and translocate and identify and and heavily monitor what Palila was doing on the landscape, what Palila were doing on the landscape. Um, they translocated wild birds from the west slope over to the, um, to the east slope. Uh, and they did that for quite a few years um, from the late 90s into the early 2000s uh, and in 2009 some funding ran out and they realized that the population of birds were doing okay at that time and um, there was a need to restore and rehabilitate and regenerate the upper the subalpine forests of Mauna Kea. So that's when that project transitioned into the Mauna Kea Forest Restoration Project, which is what it is now. So back in 2009 is when it officially transitioned into re restoration as opposed to um, dealing with birds and their biology. The focus went on restoring the habitat. And so once that transition was made, um, years and years went by and, and, and thousands and thousands of um, volunteers assisted and helped with um, restoring the subalpine dry forest. Um, at the same time, uh, if you're potentially familiar with the court case that happened in the, in the 80s, Palila versus State of Hawaii, um, uh, the this, uh, State of Hawaii was found responsible and liable for harming um, the environment that Palila relies on. So uh, what essentially happened was there was a federal court order that mandated um, eradication of all uh, feral ungulates, uh, well, feral ungulates on the mountain. And initially it, it meant all ungulates and then it ended up being um, sheep and goats. 
So essentially, we've been going over 40 years now. It's been about 40 years since that a court case. Um, the state has been continuing to try and eradicate the, the amount of sheep that were introduced to the mountain for um, for game, for hunting, right? And so we've been going on for all of this time, but um, it was realized that not only did we need to remove these animals and mitigate for these threats, that we, there needed to be rehabilitation and reforestation that happened alongside of that to help and supplement um, the forest to continue growing um, as well. And so throughout that entire time, Palila numbers were, were doing great, right? Um, the, the project at that time um, started doing some predator control, uh, predator control to try and mitigate threats for um, rats, uh, mongoose, as well as a uh, feral cat population um, that a lot of folks are unfamiliar about uh, that we have uh, in our mountains, both Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. Um, and so we've been doing that for years now. We've been doing that for years. And fast forward to 2004, we have, con we have uh, consistently observed the trend of decline for Palila. And, 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 and we have no idea why, right? We've been, we've been mitigating, we've identified or we've, at least to our knowledge, I, I have been able to identify as much of the threats as, uh, as possible. Um, you know, we mitigate for wildfire, we mitigate for um, predators. We, um, uh, we've had awesome moisture within the past 10 years, um, and we've planted thousands and thousands of trees on the mountain, yet the numbers of Palila continue to decline. And currently we're looking at roughly about 300 birds left on the mountain and uh and it's not looking good it's not looking good right and i, I don't mean for this to be doom and gloom although it seems like i'm leaning us that way <laughs> sorry <laughs> uh, um but that's kind of where we're at right now and I, I think it's i think it's healthy for us to kind of dive right in and see where we're at you know uh, it, it is reality and it's something that we're facing as managers um in this plight to save our native forest birds right and and i think the one of the important things to to recognize and uh, is that Polila is just one species. You know, we have a couple other species from other islands that are are doing a lot worse, right? That that are faced with a lot uh, larger challenges, right? I mean, thankfully, you know, our other forest birds have, have to face um, uh, avian malaria, right? But Polila, luckily, they exist in a higher elevation where the mosquitoes that carry that malaria um, aren't at that elevation, so we're, we're pretty. We're lucky that we don't have to deal with that, right? But then we're also dealing with a bunch of other challenges uh, at the same time. So, um, I don't know. I kind of started rambling there, but I think um, maybe maybe we'll, we'll hand it over to uh, to Noah for now, and then we'll jump over to me, uh, jump back to me a little bit. But I just I want to comment. Comment. Um, I think you're selling your work short a little. <laughs> the, the the Palila are. You know they're really unique species among the the main uh, the the forest birds in the main Hawaiian Islands these days. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, not I'm preaching to the choir here, but last granivore, you know, in, in the main Hawaiian Islands, their ability to eat mamane, of course, the dryland forest that you work with is unfortunately very unique nowadays. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, I just think the the work you guys are doing is really really important. But um, <clears throat> and 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 you know, who knows what the implications are for the loss of the habitat, the loss of the species, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know where to talk. I guess I should talk about myself a little. Um, so like was said earlier, um, yeah, I went to UH Hilo, um, did the Hawaiian language program for uh, my bachelor's and then didn't have enough of that apparently. And so I went, I wanted more of pain and I went into the master's program and did the, um, <clears throat> did my thesis there on the, the bird catchers. Um, I had always been into birds since I was like a kid, since I was at least eight. Um, and my professor suggested that I look into um, something called the Land Boundary Commission Testimonies, um, which occurred right after the Mahele, um, when they started privatizing land ownership in Hawaii. And then they realized they needed to understand where 
one person's land began and where another per- where that ended and began. Um, so where the boundaries between the lands were. So private landowners would pay for surveyors to go and figure out the boundaries of their lands and the government would, would send these people on. So you'd get testimony um, from people living in those areas saying, yeah, I know where the boundaries of Waikolo are. It's from here to here and to here to here to here to here. And sometimes it would conflict. But well, the reason why I was looking at those is because um, on this island in particular, a lot of the higher elevation areas had testimonies from bird catchers. And so he knew I was into the birds. And so he's like, well, you know, there's more work that can be done with these testimonies. Why don't you go look at that? And then I went off the deep end and <laughs> did way too much work in, in that. And then I started looking at the archival stuff. And then I got lucky because nobody else had done that yet because nobody else was into birds and spoke Hawaiian apparently until that point. <laughs> um, and so, and that led to the, the whole Olive thing. I found the Olive stuff that way and I held it to myself until um, our friend Alex Wong and Anya Tagawa, um, who was married to your predecessor um, up at um, Marakia, um, asked me, you know, if, if what the native name, what the Hawaiian name for that, that particular bird, Loxopsmana, should be because they didn't know of Hawaiian. And I was like, okay, yeah, I think I actually know the old name. And then, um, yeah, I've volunteered a lot with actually with Mauna Kea Forest Restoration Project um, and and um, with other groups. So I've never actually worked with birds. Um, <laughs> people tend to think I work with birds. I don't work with birds. I never have. And I, <laughs> and I think that that's, that keeps the relationship good. I probably, I probably would start to not like doing conservation stuff if I had to work because it's hard work, man. I don't know if everybody else has worked in conservation here. It's, it takes a particular kind of person. You got to... You got to be a particular breed of person. Um, so kudos to all you conservation guys out there. But um, yeah, Palila not doing so well. I, so, so I've been volunteering with the, the Endangered Forest Bird Survey since 2011. Um, and I never missed one. You know, I never missed one with the Palila specifically. Every other one, I missed at least one. Palila, I've never missed one. So yeah, I remember. I, I remember the, the forest to me looks a lot better than it did back in 2011. I think because of all of the the sheep removal efforts and the, the slow fencing of things and you know all the planting that's been going on. I don't know. I've only been part of a part of it, but I noticed a difference, a, a positive difference in, in a lot of ways. Unfortunately, there's some invasives starting to come in too, but I haven't seen a palila myself since like 2019, you know, and you've, you've sent me to places where they're supposed to be. I just haven't. I, <laughs> you're not... You're not sending me to the junk places all <laughs> when, when I when I go up to do the surveys, but I just haven't I haven't seen them. I even went up two weeks ago to go just look myself to see if I could find them. Yeah, I couldn't find them. I saw silver swords though. That was really cool. The ahinahina, they're blooming right now. Um, but you know, I wanted to ask you, Kala, because I don't really know. I noticed that you when you go way up on R10. Um, you know, kind of above the normal tree line. There's all these outplantings that have been going on. I guess it must be like the last 10 years of Mamane. It looks like it's outside of what I thought was the natural range for Mamane. Is it outside of the natural range for Mamane? Or is it like, is there a, is there a strategy there? I'm, I'm guessing there is, but I don't really know. That's that's a great question, Noah. Thank you. <laughs> Just because I was up there two weeks, two weeks ago. I was, yeah. I was literally run, wondering that. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, so... There's absolutely strategy. So uh, I, I spoke a little bit about um, some of the threats that you know some of our forest birds face, and then our um, our regular forest birds are facing threats from avian malaria, and those guys exist within a pretty specific elevation. But Palila historically would go from about five thousand feet in elevation up to tree line, right, which is about ten thousand feet, depending on what side of the mountain that you're on. But with in, um, impending um, uh, impacts from climate change. We're looking at that upper elevation where Palila exists. That um, that nice cushion starting to get a lot smaller and smaller. Uh-huh. So the strategy, to your point, is to try and expand that upper elevation tree line. So we've been specifically targeting above tree line our tens. Yeah, yeah. To try and expand more of that Mamani forest higher, in anticipation of climate change because as that cushion gets uh that band gets more narrow and narrow we would want to try to um allow Palila to 
to be able to send higher. Yeah. So is there, have you had, um, sorry, if you can't hear me, I'll try to speak. Have you had problems with the mamani then because of that? Um, because it's outside of its normal range. Like, is it too dry? Is it too cold? Is it, I don't like how, and how do, how do you deal with those problems? If, if there's problems, I don't even know. Yeah. So <laughs> elevation wise, him now. <laughs> yeah. elevation wise, it's actually not outside, right? So oh, okay, if you okay. go around the mountain, there's other areas where mamani are a little bit higher. Oh, I guess so. Yeah, there are so some, it's, some yeah. So yeah. elevation wise, it's, it's just fine. And, and if you take a look in that area and we were talking about Jeremy earlier, so that, skyline? that skyline. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. And that, that's yeah. Jeremy's legacy right there. Yeah. That whole area right there. That's Jeremy's legacy. Like that area is looking amazing because of the work that he's done. He's led and all the volunteers that he's taken up there for years, um, to plant that Momani. So oh. every time I go up there, Jeremy is who I think about. Yeah. So Jeremy is a, uh, is a really close friend of ours and, and he was a previous employee of ours. And he just recently, um, left the program to jump back into the master's program in heritage management. And so he's, yeah, he's an awesome guy. And he, um, <clears throat> excuse me. He would host a lot of our volunteers, and, and if there is any volunteers in our um, in the group um, in attendance right now, you probably met Jeremy. So yeah, um, I just wanted to say something about Noah. So he he was talking about how <laughs> I mean, not not enough can be said about him being able to rediscover the name uh, Alavi um, for our Hawaiian creeper. Right, that is absolutely amazing for us to be able to rediscover you know Hawaii for our Hawaiian forest spirits. It's absolutely awesome. And, you know, I mean, he, he needs to be in these types of conversations and presentations. But I think, I think he and I um, have two different paths uh, to bird conservation. Yeah. So Noah studied a lot of those things. He had an interest in that and, and um, you know, did his master's degree and, and really looked into a lot of um, the research that about Nalimu and, oh. and, and Hawaiian forest birds. Um, and, but he doesn't work with, with birds. <laughs> and so I was, I was the complete opposite. I had no interest in getting into conservation for birds specifically. Um, I, um, I guess this is where I'll talk about myself then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm born and raised from Waimea, right over here. Graduated from Honoka High School, celebrating 175 years, I think, right now this weekend in Honoka. Oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> I heard about that. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> um, fans. I graduated from Honoka and then uh, I went to uh, Hawaii Community College where I got my associate's degree in early childhood education. And oh. then I went into, yeah, I went into preschool teaching for a short amount of time. Oh, uh, really? And then I moved to Oahu to uh, attend uh, University of Hawaii at Manoa, where I got, uh, I studied Hawaiian studies, uh, Malamaina track and got a degree in um, Hawaiian perspectives of natural resource management. Um, and then I did that. I, I, and then I actually jumped right into the master's, uh, the master's program in the same focus and got to within a semester short of graduating and then started working in, in uh, conservation. And then I, I jumped into the um, Oahu Army Natural Resource Project um, and I was there for about eight years um, where we managed, uh, just like, it was just like the Pohulua guys up here at Pohulua, we managed, um, did mitigation work, managing endangered species on army training lands and, and, and outside in mitigation areas. Um, did that for about eight years. Um, in the meantime, met my lovely wife, had a couple of children and decided it was time to come home. And then at the time I, I looked um, for what would be the right opportunity and the right fit for me and was lucky enough to get this position with the Monica Forest Restoration Project in 2015. So next year I'll be here for 10 years. Oh, wow. um, so it's nice to be home. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so when in the last project that I worked for, we only worked with one bird species and that was the Oahu Elepayo. And, and, uh, the position that I was in was on one of the, the crews, um, natural, senior natural resource specialist with, with one of the crews. And we would do some Elepayo work, but not a lot. And it was awesome. And I, I still have a lot of aloha for Oahu Elepayo. Mm. Um, and then when I joined this project here, the focus was on restoring Mauna Kea with a caveat of, you know, taking care of Palila. And for the last, you know, 10 years, it's really been that focus. Um, but really this past year, we've dive, we've dove heavily into doing as much as we can for these birds specifically, right? Our, our, our focus is restoration of the mountain itself. Um, 
but because they're not doing so well, we've had to really switch up our focus on where are we trying to um, look for funding and what projects we're trying to look for funding for. Yeah. Uh, and then so specifically this year, we're doing a lot of heavy monitoring for these birds. We're looking at nests, looking at nest success. We're yeah. trying to dive deep into realizing what is going on with these birds, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, kind of two different, um, yeah, the size of the spectrum that we meet in the middle here. Yeah. Noah mentioned that he, he's he hasn't missed a force bird survey. So one of our uh, my responsibilities um, is we coordinate the annual survey for Palila. We we yeah. we do. There's there's numerous uh, Hawaii force bird surveys that happen throughout the year annually, um, and we we like to attend every single one of those. Is my almost my entire crew are primary observers, meaning that we can identify all of our. Hawaiian and uh, endangered and non uh, native and non native forest birds that um, are in our um, in our forests. Um, so we try to attend and and assist with all of the those uh, surveys that happen, so we can you know keep the skills sharp and be able to help with identifying you know what the what the population is like. Um, and we often ask for volunteers. Not often, every every year we need <laughs> volunteers to be able to complete these surveys. And there's a lot of folks like Noah himself who don't work for any agency who takes vacation and comes on his personal time because of his aloha for Hawaiian first words and and assist with identifying these birds for us so yeah but i, I want to say too though it's not completely i'm not a saint because um i <laughs> i i i felt i when i first started doing those I, I thought it was a really cool opportunity to be learning from the guys who are working in the field um it's like free education about the Hawaiian forest. I get to ask everybody all the questions, thousand questions, which probably was super annoying, especially in the beginning, but, um, and get to go to places that otherwise I probably would never have gone to. And it was, it's, it's always been a really educational thing for me, though there are times when you go to like the bottom of Mount Lua, or something like that, where I'm like, why am I doing this? <laughs> I took me it's in Ahopua and Hilo. Oh, there's two Maluas in, in, in Hilo and um part, part of that that land goes into Hakalao National Wildlife Refuge. Um and so the there's you know when I mean, you do the surveys in these in those forests particularly, Mauna Kea is not so bad, but um you go into the deep rainforest and you get to a certain point where the, it just gets thick, man. It is I know I haven't seen the thickest places. There's worse places than that, but it, it, they're you know I'm not in as good shape as I should be, and um, certainly not used to high elevation. But when you get sent to those places, the burning is often really good. Um, but you know you're you're climbing down little cliffs, and you got to go through the stream and climb back up the rope on the gully, and then you get to the bottom, and you're just like, okay, well now I got to get back. <laughs> <laughs> I've been hiking for how many hours now? How, how long does it take? It must be like six hours, five, six hours. And then you got to come back. And then you some, there's a couple of times I didn't get back to the cabin until like five. And it was rough. I mean, it's it's a rewarding experience in a lot of ways if, if you've never done it. But um, and again, you get to see a lot of things. You get to learn a lot of things. But in the moment, it's a little bit like it's a little hectic. I, I used to paddle too. You, do you, you paddle? No. You have the build. You look like a someone who paddles. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I kind of, it reminds me of that a little bit because you go out and, yeah, there's a couple people who are paddle. You go out, you know, you, you're out five miles into the ocean and it's like, why am I doing this? How are my arms still moving? Why? This guy keeps yelling at me. I'm trying, I'm trying, but it, it feels a little bit like that. But then when you, you die, it's like, yeah, we did a cool thing. That was really good. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but <laughs> but it's it, force force sports surveys have been a really great experience for me. Um, I started doing them because back in 2000, right, right when I graduated from my bachelor's, I there was a there was a um, advertisement. This guy named Richard Pender, who's from New Zealand, he was doing a study. Yeah, you you know him. He was doing a study of the um, lobelias up in Hakalau and the birds, he was looking at the birds going to the lobelias, trying to see how much they were actually pollinating them and how much was nectar robbing. We were also looking at the banana polka and I, I don't know, I had nothing going on. So I volunteered for a summer um, and I kind of wanted to see if I, if I was cut out for field work. 
Surprise, it was not. Um, you're out there like 10, 12 hours a day in the rain. It's summer. In the rain, all day, watching birds do their thing. And I just wanted to like poke my eye out with a, with a pencil. Um, I, back then, I only had, I had this, this, this pot. No, nobody asked for this information, but I had one of those little pot bean things. I had like, I must have had like 20 songs. And you just those same 20 songs on <laughs> songs I liked. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I learned a lot about EEV that summer. But anyway, Richard said after it, oh, you know, if you really want to learn more about birds, you should be volunteering with the first bird surveys. And so um, I got introduced to Seth Judge, who introduced me to Jackson and everybody. And I jumped through a little, a few hoops and I started doing those first bird surveys and kept going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you're still going, yeah. Still going. So Pender, Pender, Pender would come and do um, uh, some research on uh, some of the areas that we, I was working oh. with on a while. Well, so we did we we uh, one of the species that we used to work with was Cyanus superba. So it's hot, oh. and it's a super tall growing lobelid Cyanus superba killer. I yeah. va vaguely remember, now that you're yeah, saying that, yeah. I feel like he did tell us that he had done some mm -hmm, awful work. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, nice guy. Yeah. yeah for sure. Um, so I feel like we can ramble the entire time, but I, I wonder, w would it be appropriate if we asked if there were any questions so we could address some interest? Yeah, perfect. Uh, the um, first, uh, when you are in their habitat, uh, how are they, um, and if you're walking through an area where they are, do they fly off? Or do they observe you? Mm. Is there, uh, how's that relationship? Yeah, I think, I think it, would, it definitely depends on the species and then where you are. So. Uh, uh, I'll speak to Mauna Kea, right, specifically. So Mauna Kea, we have, a, we have a bunch of birds on Mauna Kea. We have some super common natives, some non-natives, you know, some exotic birds. And then you have birds like Palila. Yeah. So speaking to Palila specifically, um, they can be shy. They can be shy, right? They'll, they'll tend, if, I mean, if you walk right up to a tree and they're in that tree, they're, they'll definitely fly off. Yeah. Um, and much like birds, even nesting birds, doesn't matter the species. If a bird is nesting and incubating eggs or even, even some chicks, and you, you know, barrage your way up to a, a, a tree with a nest in it, then often they'll either do one, one of two things. They'll either bolt or they'll hunker down and hope that you don't see them. And so I mentioned earlier that we're, we're um, right now is actually nesting season for Palila. And we, we have, my crew specifically, um, in partnership with East Hawaii Wildlife. Um, we've been able to find 10 nests so far um, over the course of three months, right? And um, or, uh, of the 10 nests we've had, we've experienced, we've, we've observed the gamut of successful nests, right? Uh, the Palila will have a clutch of two eggs mm -hmm. and then ideally both eggs will, will hatch and then both chicks will fledge and then they'll leave the nest, yeah. right? And then there's signs and the things that you can uh, pick up. If you're coming to the nest after that fact, there's things that you can look and observe uh, on the nest, like specifically if the nest has, if you come to a nest and you identify a nest and there, it's empty, but there's um, scat or poop around the entire edge of it, that means more than likely it fledged two birds. It fledged two chicks because the chicks um, at that stage when they oh. get to uh, nesting size and fledging size, they'll get up to the edge of those and then they'll spend a majority of their time on the edge of the nest and poop on that nest and then they'll fledge, yeah. Um, we've also observed failed nests. We've observed um, eggs that haven't um, hatched. Um, we've observed depredation. So nest, uh, a cat actually went up into a tree and, and, and we assumed that it killed um, the, the chicks that were in there. Uh, we had a, a game cam, a game camera photo of a cat climbing up the tree, and then when we went back, uh, we, we we observed the nest with no chicks in it, which previously there were, and then on previous um, uh, observation of review of the photos, we saw a cat on there. So it's assumed that it was depredated. It may 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 not have been, but it's safe to assume. Um, but then, if you go into so you fly to Oahu, yeah. and you, uh, Oahu Elepayo, they're very territorial, mm -hmm. and they're very ni'ele. 
Um, so they're, 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 they're interested, they're, they're curious, and they'll come and fly down and they'll check you out and they're territorial and they're protective of their turtles, so they'll dive bomb you. Uh, your person, yeah, they'll, they'll dive bomb and, and try to scare you off from their territory. And then I've found, and I've had some amazing um, experience with a keppa. So I have a keppa, I've had some too. awesome experience yeah. with a keppa in Hakalau specifically, where a keppa will come and they'll just perch and they'll just yeah. chirp, chirp, chirp. Like almost within arms distance. Yeah. Almost like I, I always stand there like this, like <laughs> with my phone ready. Yeah, yeah. Come yeah. On. Yeah. Today's the day. You know, so they're 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 super curious, I kept on super curious, you know, and Apopani E V they're way up in the yeah. the crown. They don't they don't, they don't give a rip. Yeah. They don't even know you're there. Yeah. But it's really cool to have those really intimate experiences with a bird like a keppa, which is pretty rare to see. You know, so I didn't know other people examples. had that experience. It, yeah, I that thought it was unique too. too. Yeah, <laughs> it was just me. <laughs> yeah, it was like it was like for me. Oh, I know. Was like, oh, I turned around. Yeah. I was like, holy crap! This what I got. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where's my phone? Where's my phone? And then yeah, must be just us though. No, oh, okay, yeah, we're the special. Just... We're both special. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but one time I was in um Ko'ohe, you know, down in the one of those lower transects in, uh, on the mountain, and I I, I did not hear them. I swear I did not hear a single one, but when I turned around, there were five elapayo in a tree behind me, just staring at me. And they, they must have been following me yeah. for a while. Yeah. Right? yeah. Elepayo is like that too. Even Hawaii elepayo is like that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, I was going to ask you. Um, so the palila, when the, the you know when you see a nest and they, they what was the term de 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 depredation? Depredation. Yeah. When that happens with with the the, the kinky, the, do, you, do you see the females getting attacked? It, it, you know, is there a... Yeah, so that, so that happened, right? I mean, a lot of research where, where um, Dr. Paul Benko, everyone yeah. knows Paul yeah. Benko, Dr. Polilo. Um, he did, he probably did the most research. Well, no, I'm sure he did the most research on Polilo, but um, back in the early 90s and into the 2000s, they, they were the ones that first documented nests being depredated by cats so they have the foot if, if you if you if you youtube a cat in a palila nest um it was paul guys that that um were able to record that yeah. and so what happens is if a cat gets into a tree and there's a female incubating um at night specifically yeah the cat can get to that that um incubating mom and, oh. and, and eat it so yeah for sure okay let's go over here um, you mentioned cats. I'm wondering if you folks are seeing toxoplasmosis up there. So we we've never tested for it, right? Um, uh, it, it hasn't been something that we thought could be possibly affecting Palila. Um, it's that's an interesting thing to bring up, right? Because all of on the coastline, we, we know that toxoplasmosis, feral cats carry toxoplasmosis, and they affect our marine life for and sure. Allah. And Allah, and Allah, yeah, for sure. Um, it, it hasn't been something that we've um, looked into as far as the amount of contact or with feces that Palila might have. Not, not saying that it's out of the spectrum or out of the realm that that's, you know, out of possibility. But we have not. We have not. For sure. Yeah, mahalo. You got an elevation level where you see the prediction level drop off on the birds or the height of the cat and the... The predators coming up the mountain. It's sort of like a safety zone for the birds to go up for the higher birds. Yeah, so no, no, because we see cats all the way up. We see them above tree line and we see them within the core, what we consider the core of, um, of Palila territory. And actually, so we've been, we've been doing predator control across the mountain for a long time, for years, right? And then, and we've never had this amount of traps. We have about 1,500 traps, close to 2,000 traps um, on the mountain. And, and there's, there's a handful of technology that we use, right? We use kill traps, everything is humane. And we, we make sure of that. It's the, the first thing the state makes sure we do, right? And then obviously, we're, we're not about, you know, trying to be, yeah, we're not, absolutely not. So a lot, a lot of technology we use has been tried and uh, has, has tried and true and proven from a lot of work that is happening in New Zealand. Um, we utilize um, there's a there's a, a auto resetting trap called A24s 
right? It's CO2 run and they're specifically for rats. And it's awesome because you, a, a person doesn't have to go check those all the time, right? And, and they'll, they're really good for mice and rats and even some mongoose. Uh, we use, um, uh, body grip traps, uh, Kona Bear is, uh, and Bridger are, are two name brands for those. They're, these types of traps are used for beavers and otters and, and a bunch of trapping uh, across, you know, the United States for different types of, um, pelts and collecting those types of things. Um, all the way down to Victor, um, snap traps uh, on occasion. Uh, there's a handful of technology that we use. So we have, uh, utilizing all of those, we have close to 2,000 traps on the mountain. And we, on occasion, will go out and use live traps, which are a lot more labor intensive because the, the, the laws require us to get, um, check each trap, um, uh, at the very minimum 48 hours. But we, we go out and check our live traps every day. Um, so we utilize all of these and we've been trapping across the landscape of Mauna Kea. Last year, uh, two years ago, we were trapping on Pohakulo. Um, and <clears throat> wherever there's populations of humans, you'll find populations. Normally you'll find a population of feral cats, especially where humans, you know, are away from families and whatnot. And then there's food, right? So PTA has had a significant population of, of a feral cat population just in containment, yeah. just in that area, because a lot of them, when the soldiers come over on deployment, they often feed. And, and we've had a lot of conversations with the guys that work on containment. And so, um, over the years, we've had a lot of, uh, dips and valleys, um, and, and, and peaks and valleys of, uh, of our captures on Mauna Kea. Um, and we've been able to kind of consistently keep it low, right? The type of trapping that we're doing is, is great style and, and looking at getting as much, uh, um, coverage on the mountain as we can. Um, but obviously it, it's, it's not enough to eradicate these, right? As long as cats have a huge home range, right? And they can be, they, the early research showed that they would travel from Mauna Kea all the way to Mauna Loa and come back. Some healthy toms would go that far. So, I mean, I mean, that's, we're, we're within Waikoloa range, right? Yeah. Right. And I'm not saying your, your, your cat at home is taking a cruise <laughs> to Mauna Kea, eating palila and turn around and coming back. But there's a potential in that, but theoretically they could. Um, but, um, so, but for, for some reason this year, we've had a, like a really huge, um, spike in, in cat, um, captures, but like a huge spike. We're already close to a hundred captures already, um, for this year. And we only, we only, uh, trap for about six months of the year because the mountain is open for game bird hunting. And some of our traps are, um, are, are deadly to, um, the not dogs, bird. dogs. Oh, but, dogs. Yeah, humans too. If you think not, not, not deadly. I mean, you would have to be stupid. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they definitely can kill um, hunting dogs and whatnot. So there's a specific time where dogs are allowed off leash on Mount Akea, and that's only for game bird hunting. And at that time, we make sure we close all of our traps on the mountain. And that actually includes two months of so game bird hunting is for three months, and then with dog. And then two months before that, in a specific area, you can actually get a permit to train your dogs off leash. So for five months of the year, we cannot trap. So six months of the year, we can trap, right? So come February, because game bird hunting happens all the way up until um, end of January, Martin Luther King weekend. Um, we we go in and we try to hit it hard, but then February to September, and then, then we, we have to pull out. And then October, November, all the way back to February. Um, yeah, we don't trap. So we get to a certain point, we get a good level where we keep, we can kind of control um, the level of, of, of cats, feral cats on the mountain. And then we kind of start all back over, mm. start back over again. So, you know, so something like that, when, when you're dealing with trapping and, and, and species protection, uh, in order to really take a dent out of it, it's absolutely landscape. Uh, it's trapping and, and control over the, uh, at a landscape scale, but we need our neighbors to be able to, to do it as well. Right. Yeah. Cause if we're just doing it here, but all of our neighbors <clears throat> aren't doing it, then we still have ingress yeah. Yeah. of cats, you know? So it's, it, yeah. And, and, and I, I don't mean, I, I definitely don't mean to say that any of our neighbors are, they're not doing what they should be doing. Not at all. It's just at that scale. It's just how, how much it takes. So. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Model for the question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Do you know what the reproduction cycle is? 
I, you know, I, 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 I don't know what the gestation or reproduction cycle for cats are. I do know, this is what I can tell you, and that's a great question for Mr. Joe Kern. <laughs> However, we do notice that in summer months is when we see an influx in, um, in uh, uh, young. Oh. Yeah, we see a lot of kitties. A lot of young, that's when we catch a lot of young is, is during the summer months. So it's like our last ditch effort to get cats off the mountain because the young, they're, they're not trap shy, right? They're not these healthy toms that have, that have walked by the same trap for yeah. years and be like, I know what that is. I'm yeah. not sticking my nose in there, yeah. no matter how good it smells or looks. Um, but we catch a lot of young at that time, which is great because that's a new next generation yeah. that we're, we're able to stop. You know, so yeah, model for the question though. Yeah. Would you be so kind as to give us a little bit of an overview of the Hawaiian birds that you two know about and how they're doing and perhaps even like what native birds would we see here and how are they doing and as we go up the mountain? It would be so helpful for those of us that only know something to have an overview. <sighs> Yeah, absolutely. Is, is it right if you, if I hand the mic to you? Uh, oh, I can start, I guess. Um, it's depressing. Oh. <laughs> um, gosh, we're just talking about the statistics. Uh, so I think in general, in most places, the, so the native Hawaiian honeycreepers, which is a specific group of birds, um, some people say a subfamily of birds, are decreasing in most places. Um, the vast majority of them. And the, the big driver of that for, for most species, Pumila being a major exception, is, is disease um, carried by mosquitoes, mostly the avian malaria, though I, I would assume avian pox has some, something to do with it too, I don't, I don't know, um, which are both diseases that are not from Hawaii. They got here later. Um, I think pox came here probably when mosquitoes got here, I guess, in the, the 1820s, 1830s. And then I, I've heard that malaria is thought to have gotten here in the 1920s, maybe 19 teens. Um, I don't remember how they did it. I think they did genetic work to try to figure that out. Rob Flesher, them. Um, uh, yeah, um, there are a couple of species that have developed something of a resistance to these diseases. Most well known, the most well known of those is going to be the Amakihi on this island, the Hawaii Amakihi. Um, in certain places on this island, you'll start to see them around people's homes, particularly in Puna, um, in lower elevations. And those seem to be separate populations of birds um, from birds that live up, like, for example, on Mauna Kea, which don't seem to have the same level of resistance. Um, there's a degree of resistance that seems to be appearing in Apapane as well. On Oahu, the Oahu Amakihi, which is a different species, seems to be developing pretty heavy levels of resistance, which is great. So Amakihi are great, you know, they're our fighters. I saw some years ago, somebody had made a sticker with an Amakihi with boxing gloves and it was punching the mosquito. You remember that one? I always thought that was really cool. Um, but a lot of our other species are continuing to, to decline, other than Palila. Um, I'm sure you've heard in the news, Akikiki on Kauai are functionally extinct um, in the wild at this point. There's, I think, about five that they know of um, every year, fewer and fewer. And that's because the mosquito line, uh, as climate change has continued to progress, has been going higher and higher up the mountain in most places and is expected to overtake the peaks of most mountains on most islands um, sooner rather than later. Um, but particularly on Kauai. The Akeke'e is another species on Kauai that's crashing right now. I don't know what the numbers are. It must be something comparable to Palila. I think it's worse. It's worse. Yeah. So are we down to like... A Either Akikiki or Akeke'e uh, is like worse. Uh, yeah, Akikiki is, is fine. Akeke'e has got to be really low too. It's but it, yeah, the, those guys are pretty much going into captivity at this point. Um, though I know there's discussions for other ways to try to mitigate what's happening. Um... Brett Mossman was just telling me that he had been hearing that Ani and Yao are down to about a thousand individuals on Kauai. That's another Kauai endemic. Um, KVQ on Maui, the Maui parrot bill you might have heard of. Um, the, the Hawaiian name is a newer name that was given in 2011. Um, they're down to about 300 as well. And they're in a very small area. Um, I think it's, what is that, more like Kaupo, Kipahulu area. Um, 
Akohe Kohe, about a thousand individuals on Maui, the Crested Honey Creeper. Um, they're looking at ways to try to deal with that as well. Um, the only two species I remember from Rick Camp's presentation earlier this year that are that are improving overall uh, is, in numbers is Alawahio um, on Maui, the, the Maui creeper. It's a pretty little puffball bird, kind of greenish yellow color. Um, and um, Akiapula'au on this island, which is, uh, it's, I think it's considered critically endangered. Yeah, there must be what, like 3,000 or something? Yeah. But they're, they're doing particularly well. Um, I, it's gotta be because of all the coal planting and Hakalao and Keoho and places like that where just massive, massive amounts of coal have been planted in the last like 40 years. Um, and you know, they they love those young koas. I remember one, uh, one year we were out serving in Keoho and um, we've got like 25 Akiapola all in, in a single transect. Yes. And we came back from the, the survey and nobody believed us. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was kind of crazy. That was all in these really young koas. They just, they love the bugs in those young koas trees. Um, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of sad things happening. Um, in a lot of places, there's still a lot of hope. The, the Birds Not Mosquitoes initiative is one of those bright spots. We have technology today that we never had before. So it, if you look at Hawaii's history with the birds, it, it seems like extinction tends to come in waves. You know, you have a wave that happened right after um, people first got here, the, the people who became the Hawaiians first got here. Um, whereas big wave of extinction happened and for a number of reasons, probably habitat destruction, introduction of all kinds of things. They were probably eating some of them. Then you see another wave of extinction happening around the 1600s. And I, I think that has to do with the expansion of the population and agriculture that's around the time of Umi. And, you know, all these major elite were organizing us into having a, a more stratified society. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the extinction wave that happened when um, Europeans came. Um, and there was, again, a lot of habitat destruction, introduction of cats, uh, new kinds of rats, et cetera, et cetera. Then an extinction wave happened in the mid to late 1800s. Um, when mosquitoes got here, another extinction wave in the 20s and 30s, another extinction wave in um, the 60s going into the 80s. And then now we're, we're in, I would say we're, we're kind of in the middle, beginning to middle of another wave of extinction that's happening. Um, and, and it's all for these different reasons. Where was I going with that? <laughs> I don't know. It's going good. It's going good. Though. There's a, I was there's a, there's a point I had to this. I don't remember. <laughs> I, I lost myself. Um, but oh, through, when all these other waves of extinction happened, a lot of them were, were related to mosquitoes and the diseases that they carry. Um, and I think we've known for a long time if, if that mosquitoes were a factor. And I'm sure there are people around who were who were around when the the last big wave of extinctions happened, and I'm sure that you know it upsets them greatly to this day. But we have a tool that we did not have back then. This tool where we can try to control the numbers of mosquitoes. We don't know if it's going to work, and it's very expensive, and it's a lot of work, and it takes a lot of resources. But gosh, it's worth a try. Can't just sit around and do nothing and then say, "Oh well, so too bad, so sad." You know, in 20 years when. They're all gone and they might be gone anyway. I don't know, but we have to try. Gotta try. Yeah. What is that? What is what? The what is that new wave technology? Uh, so that, that's the, the um, oh, what is the, the term? My, I know it. Yeah. Sorry. Somebody said it. Sterilization, Sterilization of the mosquitoes through um, Wobakia. 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 Yeah. yeah. What's, it's the, a what's the proper term of the technique? You it's, it's, a, it's a bacteria that's introduced into males into males and the males pass it on to females that will sterilize the females so it, it it'll essentially stop them from stop the reproductive cycle because the females are the ones that sting and carry the carry um the, uh, the avian yeah blood. yeah yeah females are the ones that sting you too right so yeah, yeah. here or just maui <clears throat> maui is where they kind yeah, yeah where, where right they now. first right now where yeah. they're just starting to do some releases on that but i, I think that was a great overview as far as the hawaii forest birds but as far as here on hawaii island where elevation wise where you be able to observe some of these birds so unfortunately, where we're at, we won't be able to see any of our Hawaiian honey creepers, right? But as you get up a little higher on Mount Akea specifically, you'll start getting into these areas where, um, well, obviously the first ones you'll be able to see. Actually, so honey creepers, no. 
But in these eras, you should be able to see Eo and Puyo, which is amazing, oh, yeah. right? I think we take for granted yeah. the ability and, and, and how often we are able to see these these raptors, right? Yeah. And these predatory birds. Puyo and Eo are so amazing. And there's something that no other island has those, right? Or, or at least to the numbers, no other island has Eo. And in Oahu and in some of the other islands have, have Pueo. But, but we got rare, them both. Really and, and yeah, and, and they're super rare. It's hard to find Pueo on any other island. And it's something that we take um we take for granted. Because you know, when I moved home from living on Oahu and it was it was absolutely amazing to see Pueo and Eo just everywhere, right? In town. Yeah. Right. And I think when you think about that, that's that's what I envision for that I would like to see for Alala. Yeah. Right. I want to see Alala acting like or behaving like ravens. The ravens they are. Right. You go to California. You go to Japan. They're they're nuisance. They're all over yeah. the they're all over the transfer station. They're that flying all over problem. Disneyland. Right. Yeah. They're an issue. Right. Yeah. Right. And then, but I, but I feel like if if we are hoping to experience Alala thriving i think our mindset or our idea of where they thrive needs to potentially change you know like i mean we we attempted to try and you know, reintroduce alala and 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 release alala into in what what we consider you know as perfect forest and and, and great habitat and sure it was um but they had to fend for themselves against against eel um and they were you know they weren't doing too well he was conking them yeah, you know, but uh, but they weren't they weren't out long enough to you know learn and 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 fend for themselves before we as humans got way too uncomfortable with that and said nope yeah let's pull them all back in you know and <clears throat> and that's a whole nother conversation that needs to be started as, as far as land managers and managers you know doing species recovery I mean that's that's tough you, no one wants to be yeah. the person you know that was like made the wrong decision and made a bird go extinct right or made a, a species go extinct you know but i think unfortunately it's those the fear of making those types of decisions is what keeps us stuck and and not and then not moving forward yeah. you know that that's that's really tough decisions to be able to make you know so but sorry moving on to our honey creepers if you moving up the mountain Going up towards um, Mauna Kea, you should start to see, um, up, up, uh, sorry, um, Amaki. So Amaki, at least on Mauna Kea, number one most common Hawaiian forest bird you can find on Mauna Kea. If you spend any time on Mauna Kea, Amaki everywhere. Yeah. It's a great you, place to burn It's a great, falls. it's a great place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mauna Kea is a great place for birding because there aren't a lot of birds compared to like, if you go to Hakala, forget it. It is so noisy. I mean, it's amazing. But you'll be so overwhelmed. There's so much. There's so much going on. You know, like it's it's hard to even keep track of yeah. and concentrate on something. It was it was a nightmare trying to learn birds at Hakalau, right? I mean, <laughs> and I and, and I'm, I'm serious. I'm serious. You know, I mean, it, it's cool because it's kind of a double sword because you're in heaven listening to all these amazing birds. But at the same time, during a survey, you're expected to count in the each and individual each and every bird that's out there right and estimate the amount of birds that you're seeing per species yeah. and the distance yeah yeah you know it's very overwhelming yeah. you know but after you, 20 you up a party yeah, you, yeah. you start getting it's like, it's the same one. I'm, I'm sure it's like 150 out there like 150. <laughs> you know but and then but i and then those are just some of the, the little nuances of forest bird surveying which is really really cool um but Mauna Kea is a really, really awesome um, place to be able to observe majority of the endangered birds and honey creepers that we have left on this island here. I mean, you can just drive south. As, as you go over Puhululu and you start driving back down to Hilo, you get up a pane and I'm a key, flying over the road yeah. all the time. You know, if, 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 if you ever try to pay attention to that, you'll be able to see those red birds going over. Yeah. And majority of the time it's up a pane. Yeah. And if you want to be able to see um, at least a handful of the endangered birds that we still have left on Hawaii Island. Kalanamanu is an amazing right. place to yeah. go. Yeah. Kalanamanu Trail, nice little short trail. Spend enough time in there, you'll see, you see, if you're lucky, you see them all, except for Palila. Right. You see Apapani, Iivi, Akepa, um, Oma'o, Akiapola'ao. So, somebody Palavi. said they saw one recently. Yeah. 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 So, and then Puo Trail right across the street, a um, little bit down the road, but across from that. But Kalanamana Trail is a really good one 
because it's not hilly trail, really nice, you know, good for Kupuna. Right. You walk yeah. right yeah. in there, okay. and it's a short one in Kiki. Yeah. And you can just walk down and, and just take your time and, and just hang and just take your binoculars and just see what you see. And there's some good information there on the plaques. And yeah. that, that's probably the number one place I would recommend yeah. for folks to be able to easily access yeah. to observe any one of the birds that we still have. Yeah. Um, Volcano is a really good spot to see the red birds too. Like yeah. you go to the Kilauea Lodge and you get up upon in EV all over the place yeah. over there, you know? And so it, it's pretty cool. But I think. <clears throat> I think something if 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 you're at all interested in in our Hawaiian forest birds, and even if you're not, <laughs> I think it's more more and more it's it's more important for more folks to be able to go out and experience observing these birds in the wild. Because I mean, how can you live in Hawaii and not be able to enjoy that experience of seeing what old Hawaii was like? Those are kupuna. And those are kupuna, and they, they trace their genealogy long before anybody was here on these islands, you know. And to be able to drive up to a spot and just walk right out and and see some of these birds, I think that, that's I think that's pretty amazing. That's something that I'm not going to talk for Noah, but I do take for granted, right? I mean, the fact that we we go up and we work with Palila often, and yeah. um, I take for granted that fact. But it's always exciting when we see Palila, you know. And and if and for those of you that have been able to observe Palila in a while, that's amazing. Um, and now more than ever, now is the time yeah. go up and see, right? Like, like I said, we're looking at 300 birds in the wild. Yeah. We're looking at Palila going, if, if, if the trend continues, Palila will go functionally extinct in two years. So meaning that birds, there'll be less than 30 birds, right? And that's a hard pill to swallow right now. Yeah. That absolutely sucks because two years is not far down the road. Right. So we're on we're we're at triage level right now, right? We've we just came out of a meeting a couple of weeks ago, a week long meeting of intense debate and uh, you know, think tanks and thought process that was supposed to only last a week. It's it's carried on outside of that as as expected, right? Because unlike the other forest birds when we where we have I absolutely identified what the issues are, like we we still don't know what's going on with Palila and well, what's causing it to decline or if there's multiple things that are like popping back up you know like or all of the mitigation that we've been doing this entire time maybe it's not working anymore yeah. right? which which are crappy things to try and think about i mean the last thing i want to i want to think about is the work that i've been doing over the 10 past 10 years is not working or we've been doing a crappy job at right and that's the last thing i want to hear yeah. right or i wasn't doing enough Right. You know, and that's absolutely the last thing I want to hear. No, right? I don't think that's the case. And so, but yeah. my message is, go see the birds. Yeah. Go see the birds. And they're super, super accessible. Yeah, yeah. They're super accessible, you know, thanks to that call on the Montreal. And yeah. if you like see Paulino, volunteer at Mount Kia Forest Restoration Project. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> I, I want to add to that too. It's like I, as we have, yeah, like Kalan saying, we have an opportunity here on this island to have a relationship with the birds, with birds in general. Um, that we, is harder to have on the other islands. I grew up on Oahu, and I remember the first time I saw an amakihi. I begged my father to take me on my tenth birthday up to Tantalus because I I heard had amakihi up there, and we found one. And I I, I still remember it in a guava tree in my mind's eye. And, um that was super special but it's, you know it's like the most common bird <laughs> but i hadn't seen a native forest bird up until that point i've been reading about them for years but i think it's super important for us to build relationships with our landscape to it's it's a normal thing that humans are supposed to have um that we've kind of unfortunately not always been able to have in in more recent centuries um we are a part of the environment interact with the birds interact with the trees interact with with everything because that's they are they are just as marvelous much a part of us as our own backyards and and we are a part of this major system that we are you know we we depend on it it feels like the, the extinction of something like the pali that doesn't really affect us but it is a greater sign of other things going on in this island this island has been drying out over the last hundred years um there's less and less water um the forests have disappeared to a large extent um i've heard estimates like two-thirds of hawaii's forests in general have, have disappeared and that's got to be having an impact um i've seen old 
articles, you know, from Hawaiians or, or, or archival notes for Hawaiians talking about in Hawaii in the 1920s, old people were saying, oh, you know, Hilo used to be a lot more rainy when I was a kid. It's the 1920s. And I hear people today saying that too. Hilo used to be a lot more rainy when I was a kid. I, I think I've even, almost 20 years I've been living in Hilo, but I, I think I can even say that I've observed that. And trying to learn a little bit more about, you know, the wind and the rain and comparing it to how people saw things in the, in the old days. I think it is different. The wind is not coming from the same direction as it did a hundred years ago. It used to be more from the north, at least in Hilo, which meant more water. And now it's coming further and further, and further from the from the east. Yeah, it's a different wind than it used to be. So we gotta be paying attention. If you're a farmer, you would know these things. You probably would know it, notice it because you're relying on your crops growing. But I'm not a farmer, um, <laughs> so I have to be super intentional about it. And that uh, you know. Make, make the space if you can. Yeah, and now is the time. Um, Kala, I wanted to ask you something that just popped into my mind that probably nobody else really is interested in, but I, I wanted to ask you. So one of the few cultural things I've ever seen about Palila, and I'm sure you've seen it too, is a note from Scott Wilson, who was a bird collector from, the, from England who came in the 1880s, and he mentions the natives of Waimea say that when the Palila bird calls repeatedly, it is a sign of coming rain. I've never observed anything that supports that. Have you? Because you spent a lot more time up there than me. Yeah, uh, you know, unfortunately, with the amount of polio that we have left yeah. and where they spend time, it's hard to observe that. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. And then it was also mentioned in Valley, right? And there's all yeah, yeah, that that mentioned that as well. That was one of the main sayings Polila called the, the Ua for sure. So, yeah, I have unfortunately not been able to observe that. Yeah. So, I think, <clears throat> sorry, before you, there was a gentleman that was sitting in the back that had raised his hand. <laughs> Uh, you, you answered it. Okay, you know. All right, go ahead. Okay, we'll go, we'll go on this side. Um, I, so I live in dry land area, quite high. We have um, you and Foil. I live in the of Um, the Papua, and uh, I, for a short period of time, lived on the way in the early 2000s. <laughs> The the we have them in our area. Very few, but I hear them at night. Oh, yes, yep, yeah. I hear them. And I'm wondering, do you guys have an idea of how many might be on the island still? Oh, no, no, I'm absolutely not, no. Yeah. <laughs> There's definitely a small community of them, because right now is the season when they're flying. Yeah. And they come out, at mm -hmm. you can hear them. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can hear the whistle, and so they're there. And I was just curious to know if you guys have any numbers or, you know, so it's uh, probably like right any people mm -hmm. all around. Oh, okay, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like below Kahua, and I've also seen some nesting um, come out the side of Kapa'a State Park because I'm the ranch land in there. Oh, wow. And I ride in there. I, I'm seeing the holes, and I've been, I've heard some of those, mm -hmm. but I just wondered if you guys had an idea of like any numbers that would be here. I was surprised that they were here because I've only ever seen them on. Oh, that's, that's, that's killer. Is that Uwa'u or Uwa'u Kani? Brown patrol that lives underground, they underground. They will do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure. I can only hear them. I mm. don't really see them because they, they don't come out until dusk, right? Are yeah. they flying up Malka or down? I live about 800 feet, 900 feet. Yeah, that's interesting. It's not, it's not Uwa'u right then. It could be, yeah. 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 That's... So, so I just was curious to know if you guys had any I will comment on faster than you. Oh, yeah. but so I have no idea what the numbers are like. Uh, I will mention though, so recently as of last year, a year before, Brett Mossman, who's a, yeah. a forest bird biologist with, with the state. Well, he's a forest bird biologist, but that's not his actual title, but he is. Um, but he actually just rediscovered Ua Ua on Mauna Kea, right? Okay. I, I don't know if anyone had heard about that, but that's amazing because they hadn't been seen on Mauna Kea observe nesting for a long time. Like, thought, like okay. folks thought that they, they weren't nesting on Mauna Kea anymore. Well, I've often thought to myself, I wonder if anybody even knows they're here. Yeah, because some people know. And most people don't even, like, they Yeah, people don't know, yeah, 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 yeah. generally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so absolutely, so there's a, that, there's a, absolutely, um, there has been observance uh, and proof of nesting Oahu on, uh, on Mauna Kea on the East Slope. Of Mauna Kea enough to where we we have a fence. Uh, the Department of Hawaiian Homes has built a fence, Kuli Kamara, yeah. 
um, spearheaded uh, building a fence to protect the the ground nest there with predator control so in I, I yeah in combination with for sure for sure yeah yeah like you know yeah I know two guys specifically could answer your question uh, yeah. <laughs> for sure for sure maybe they can be the next guys that come on, on this talk yeah. they, can, they, they can talk specifically about birds but yeah yeah no for sure yeah. Yeah, Brett probably would have an idea. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if anybody's looked in that particular side of Kohala. Yeah, I don't know. Well, but it's, it's just, you know, because it's just, it's dry land. And that's low, uh, that's yeah. low elevation too. So up, up in it, like Puohomi. Yeah. Uh, up on a summit for sure. There's, there's, um, there's nests up there because they're, they're doing. Yeah. But you know those, who, who they, they, they do, um, they t in some places, not always, they have corridors. Yeah, they like they, these like highways that they follow back and forth. So you, you could be on one of the highways. I mean, that's interesting. I, I think I want to say in that area, if I remember correctly, there was bird catching for Uwa'u before the, uh -huh. the okay. teratroma, Uwa'u. Yeah. Anecdotally, I can say that um, somebody I caught it with back in 2016 was working up at the wild bird sanctuary or whatever in Kohala. Yeah. And he had one to release, and we took it out, and we took it out from Kauai. Oh, oh, okay. And so I don't know. They got grounded. Around. <laughs> oh. But yeah, you should yeah. keep an eye out in a couple months when the the fledging season yeah. happens. Yeah, if, see if anybody gets grounded. Yeah, like yeah. Um, People banging into them, or are they whacking the the, the, the lights, lights and, the, and yeah. The, yeah, we see a lot power, of power lines. Mm. Yeah, so, so what for those who don't know the uh, Wa'u and A'o are two two of our species that are um, endemic seabirds and they nest way up in the inland areas of the islands and um, they they travel back and forth um, they're both endangered um, and some places haven't been seen in a really long time but people like Brett then have been have been rediscovering populations that were thought lost Light pollution is a big problem for them. Um, when you, you know, for example, if you have a, a, a floodlight, you know, out of your house, they they might see that when they're flying, especially the young ones who are going on their first flight down to the ocean, and they'll think they, they'll get confused because they follow the moon. Because it's nighttime birds. Yeah, and they they fly at night. Yeah. yeah. So that's really interesting, though. Yeah. Oh yes. So some Waimea Kupuna told me a long time ago that their grandparents remember seeing flocks of quail that was dark in the sky. And then recently Brett Mossman reminded me that like it ignites my imagination that there were so many millions of birds on the islands that the entire nitrogen phosphorus cycle completely destroyed and it affects from the forests and the uplands down to the coast. Can you talk about that? Because there's no more guano. Yeah. And that places, would be, Brett said that there's places on the coast that would just be white with guano. Yeah, there's some, so birds like that, seabirds, generally nest in really big colonies and, you know, we're not an exception. And there used to be millions and millions of them. And there's a couple of records that suggest that until the 1800s, there might have still been places where there were big populations like that. They were, they were hunted regularly um, every season by Hawaiians in different places. There's some debate as to whether or not common people would eat them. I, I personally think that they did. Maybe the chicks were only for the ali. E. But it was it was an important food source in certain places. Um, and it's a food source that's gone. The birds are gone. And I'm sure, yeah, like Brett is saying, the, the guano that seabirds create, all that phosphorus and whatever comes from their poop, has got to be having an effect on the ecosystem. Um, and the, the lack of those seabirds probably has an effect on those ecosystems that probably affects what's able to grow in certain places. I mean, I, I don't know if we have, we would even be able to guess what that impact would be. Uh, you have any, any comments? No, comments? no comment from Kala. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. What well, were um, an important part of the ecosystem that is badly damaged. And I think, you know, what Kuali is leading with the, the, the fencing and other people are leading in, uh, of these populations, that is like a, that is a really bright spot, I think, in conservation because I, I, I think before, you know, if I live a long time, before I die, it is possible that we could get to 
a point where these populations are starting to rebound and maybe we can even start thinking about hunting them again. Because supposedly there's nothing that tastes quite like an owa'u. It's supposed to be the best bird to eat. Um, Maybe kolea. <laughs> kolea, kolea I, I, from what I've talked to people who have tried kolea, yeah, <laughs> oh, it's illegal. <laughs> it's illegal. But I, I've talked to people who ate kolea before, and I'm gonna say who, but it, it's supposed to be one of those birds. And don't, please don't go hunting the kolea. There's a specific season, in specific ways, and sometimes they're not very humane um, to, to hunt them. But they're supposed to be one of those birds, like. You, you catch one and you eat it and they're not that big, but you eat one and it's like so fatty that you don't, you cannot eat any more than one. Rich. Yeah, it's just so rich. Yeah. I would assume what might be similar, especially the young ones, but. Yeah. <laughs> you have to assume that because Kukuna would hike all the way up to the summit. It must be good. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hey. Good. <laughs> Questions? Questions? Yes. With your efforts and uh, known successes introducing the Mamane as a, a reforested area for the Pamula, how does that translate to their range as far as nesting as well? Yeah, so that's 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 obviously the, the long term goal, right? I mean the trees that we're planting, even the planting over these past ten years are won't be usable as far as or produce enough yeah. pods for these birds to actually use for another 20 maybe so about 30 years ago division division of forestry and wildlife they did they actually started the high elevation now plantings and, and planted hundreds and hundreds of mamani that are just now at that maturity at that age where we've started to see the palila actually utilize them we've observed palila in those in both eating and nesting in trees that were planted by the early foresters or early foresters i mean 30 years ago you know so that's 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 pretty cool. So that, I mean, it's it's been done before. Um, we know and we hope, crossing our fingers, that there still be palila around. Um, you know that long, uh, so they can utilize these trees. But you know, but young mamare will will produce pods. You know, within a year, year or two, they can start producing pods. But palila has shown um, to take favor yeah, and preference to particular trees, um, trees that produce maybe a high amount of of pods or there's a specific low alkaloids. So like the mamani pods are like super toxic, right? Highly toxic. Palila have, have, um, have uh, grown over these years and, and um, been able to, they're the only species that can actually ingest the toxicity of these pods and so much so that they're very, um, they're food specialists, right? Sorry, you can see Kaolabe. Is that Kaolabe over there? Very awesome. Aloha, Kanaloa. Nobody say aloha to Kaolabe over there. <laughs> Sorry, so um, Pali have evolved over all of these years to be the only, one of the only, spe only, the only species to ingest um, the highly toxic mamane pods, the green mamane pods. And um, unfortunately, they're food specialists, you know, and so when, when the mountain was running rapid of sheep, un unmanaged sheep, um, that forest ended up, it was, was very, was threatened, right? So that's not the case anymore, which is awesome. But I think the, the bird, the species are absolutely trying to play catch up, you know, play, trying to play catch up. Oh, they, they, nest, they nest in other trees too, yeah. They nest in other trees, so we will observe them nesting in Nile, um, Nile and Mamani cold dominant trees on Mount Kea, right? So mainly those two trees, Mamani and Nile. Yeah, but but food wise, over ninety percent of their diet comes from that those pods, and then the um, the Syria caterpillars they find feeding on those immature pods, they feed to their young. So pretty important species for those guys. So. Mm -hmm. okay. No questions? Anything we comments? Yes. I have a question. Sure. Um, so when I work with the teacher foresters, I personally have no big bird increase. Do um, you guys have any insight into how I can encourage fourth and fifth graders to have an interest in birds and how I can help encourage or help nurture that interest in them? Yeah, that's a good question. And actually, that, that, that's very important, actually, because that's that's where it actually starts, right? So growing up, we learned nothing about our native birds when I grew up. Going through school, intermediate, elementary, all the way to high school, 
I didn't. I could not identify a single bird. I thought my bird was probably native. I knew. I knew. I knew. Poly, uh, I'm sorry. I knew Puyo and Eo. I knew those, right? Almakua. Everybody knows Almakua, right? I knew that. But none of our forest birds. I could not identify a single bird to you. And actually, I never know Palila until I started working for this program, right? So but then, so we grew up not learning anything about these birds. But and I think that that's absolutely where it starts because when you start teaching those things early enough, you start teaching that value system. When you start valuing what is native to us, that stays with you as you grow, right? Because you start valuing what is actually native and, and what is from here, right? And we had a monarchy specifically has a long history of, of introduced animals that were completely <laughs> significantly more valued than, than our native birds, right? And which is clear with how controversial the eradication order is on monarchy, right? Yeah. And that, that's, that shows a clear disconnect with tradition, with value, right? Of valuing something that is, well, something that is introduced, but also can feed your family over kupuna that were here from before we even were, you know, before humans even were here, right? So, um, as far as how, how you can, encourage the youth i think now more than ever is the best time and we have we have the most amount of materials and it's never been cooler to be into birds than right now seriously i mean there's so much i mean like i i i was thrust into the bird world and i have converted into a bird nerd myself you know but there's so much swag there's so much curriculum there's so much there's so much media available um, about our native um, Manu that are that uh -huh. it's easy to um, Mahalo, sweetheart. Mm. Um, <laughs> that's it's easy for us to um, to encourage you know the next generation uh, to to learn these birds you know and and well I mean schools are starting to uh, pick up on that and starting to teach it in in uh, in the classroom. Um, we've done a handful of presentations in the classroom for a bunch of schools and and we see a lot more schools coming out um to us it would be awesome to be able to show palila to a lot of these schools right i mean if you show these kids the birds and, and they'll remember it for yeah. sure right but i think you know jumping back onto how accessible kalana manu is i mean yeah. that that's a resource that yeah. i don't think gets tapped enough i mean schools should be flocking to that trail to be able to see these birds i mean you know, and, and you don't you don't realize how amazing that is until they start disappearing. You know, until they start disappearing, and then you're like, oh, oh, I remember when I used to be able to just drive right over here, pull on the side of the road on this road, and I could see all these birds over here. But now no more. I can only see one. You know, it's kind of nuts. Yeah, it's kind of nuts. Yeah. Well, I, I I actually until recently I worked in education for gosh. I don't know, but this must have been like eight years. Like, but um, you know what I noticed? I used, so I used to work at the National Park and, and I was the field trip guy. So like all, all the kids came through me for field trips. But what I, what I noticed was compared to when I was a kid, because yeah, we didn't learn those things at all. At all. And even like Hawaiian stuff, you barely learned anything. Mm -hmm. But um, there's so much, I mean, it, there's a long way to go granted, but there's so much more educated now about birds and about the Hawaii things in general than they used to be. And it's the teachers. I swear it's the teachers pushing it, mm -hmm. um, which is fantastic to see. But I, yeah, I know what you mean. Like I, I've taught a few classes myself and it, it's, you want to inspire. Yeah. You want to inspire. And that is always the trick. How do you inspire people? How do you inspire a kid to want to learn more? How do you give them just enough that they go, okay, I want to, I'm addicted to this Kool-Aid now and I'm going to drink the EEV for the rest of my life uh, and join the cult of birds. Uh, um, and I think, yeah, like you're saying, Kala, like the, the experiences are, are really important to that and positive experiences for them to, to remember as they get older. I, I've noticed with a few kids that has helped, that has helped, you know, when they first see, I took a friend's kid once to Pua Ultra and we got lucky and we saw that male Akiopola'o and he was like, I think I like birds. And I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> you like birds now. Um, but Kalona Manu is a, is a really great resource. And I was so happy when they opened that because it, it's so accessible, like you're saying. Um, yeah, I think it's your exposure. Exposure is the, is the most we can do because how can you care about something if you don't even know it exists? Um, I think 
being able to take people to places is great because it's hard to love something that you never see, see or feel or touch. Um, it's just a concept then, a very abstract thing. So personal experiences that a person can remember to be able to latch on um, if they want to are the way to go. Yeah. I think it's, it's never been cooler to be into birds, but I think it's probably never been harder to get kids interested in birds, right? I mean, there's so much distractions, you know, And but I think there's a lot of small businesses and awesome, you know, social media, the thing that distracts, but it's also the thing that can really help educate um, kids with how awesome our manu are. Sorry, go ahead. Has anybody ever recorded the, you were, you were talking about all the bird song in Kakalao, the palila is done, that bird song, the chorus changes. Mm. And I was thinking, you know, you wake up in the morning, you hear all these birds, and I realize there's not a single native bird in that song that you're hearing when you wake up. So to not have a recording of what you hear now, for instance, in Hapalao, would be a terrible loss. Yeah, so absolutely. Is anyone doing that? Because as time goes on, it's going to be gone. For sure, for yeah. sure. I think that's an amazing um, record, you know, to be able to recognize that, like what you're hearing outside is not native. That's really cool that you that you recognize that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know birds. Um, but yes, yeah. And then for years, right? For years, folks, uh, there's been a lot of research done on uh, vocalizations and recordings. And a friend, really good friend of ours, colleague of ours, has uh, most recently did a bunch of polylo vocalizations and trying to decipher the difference in calls and alarm calls and, and songs, whisper songs. And But for years, all of these birds have, it's probably one of the, the things that has been research the most is vocalizations it's very unique right and then I, I encourage all of you if you're at all interested in birds download the merlin app yeah amazing app for helping to identify birds both by sound description by sight um and and and, and yeah yeah that's they, ha they absolutely have hawaiian birds so i use them we use we use that app yeah we we use that app all the time yeah and it's really really awesome and 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 it'll uh, by geographic location too. So they'll tell you what area, yeah. and what you should be seeing. Yeah, because like in California, you got the white crowned sparrows and they've discovered that they have different dialects. Oh yeah. 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 So yeah. Here, yeah. Curious, you know, someone, yeah. That's a master's degree. Oh, for <laughs> sure. Yeah, and you could probably go beyond that too. No, there, there are. So like our, our, our friend who, she, she did that for a master's degree on poly level vocalizations. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. It's yeah, it's past. It's seven or nine. I, I don't know if anybody have any more questions. We can continue to chat, or we can come talk to her later. Go ahead, Mr. Judd. Um, as a professional in this field, you know, my whole career, the course is changing faster than we can adapt to it. And um, from the bird's perspective, if you took the gloves off and could do one thing for the bird. Ooh. As a person in the community, not in your job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he just made that question even harder. Yeah. So uh, it's obviously yeah. in context, as a you know, Bobokia is crazy, yeah. but it's realistic. Yeah. yeah. It's like feasible. Yeah. You know, a lot of things people don't think are feasible. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. Mom for answering your own questions, Zach. That's exactly what I would do. You know, I, I, and, and no, I mean, really, right? I, and even sort of, so, as biased as I am as far as polila management goes, Wabaki is not going to, right now, as far as we know, doesn't do anything to help Palila. Um, but the rest of our forest birds absolutely need something. Right, and, and it's you know, it potentially can be scary, right? We're talking about releasing a bacteria, introducing a bacteria into a mosquito, and a mosquito spreading this. But there's a potential that this could absolutely help protect our forest birds and have them persist and and um, expand in population, you know, moving forward. And I think that's that's something that we, we gotta try, you know, we have to try. And and I, I mentioned earlier, right, I talked about the ravens, I talked about all la and thinking outside of the box when it comes to managing and managing species and, and species recovery. And I think we, we will have to, moving forward, think outside of the box. We're gonna have to get comfortable with trying things that we haven't tried or trying things that we're not comfortable with and making decisions 
that we're gonna have to face the consequences yeah. for if they don't work, right? Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, it's like we right gotta that. try, right? right? And, and and agencies were very deathly afraid of that, right? I mean, as you can probably imagine, nobody wants to be the guy. For good reason. Nobody wants yeah. to be the guy. I don't like being the guy, but I mean, if it came down to trying something or not trying something, how, how do you make that decision? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, that's not. I, I gotta tell you something funny. <laughs> The difference between try and triumph is just a little oomph. Ooh. <laughs> nice, Liz. Is that not the silliest? That is actually. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we need to do. A little, little oomph. <laughs> All right, I gotta stand up. <laughs> Molly, is that, that was awesome. Molly, I'm gonna use that too. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> What else? No? no? I just want to say that like whether or not our species are still in supply, the work that is being done is super, super valuable. And I hear a lot of personal responsibility from you guys up there. We all work in, we have lots of limitations. And the work that you're doing is positive no matter what the data says. At the end of the day, I know there are so many positives coming from all the things that you're doing. And Mahalo you for that. Mahalo Jen. 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 Mahalo Jen.